All right, today our uh, scripture reading is Mark 9, verses 1 through 13. Uh, Jesus is speaking to a crowd and uh, to his disciples, and he says, he says, He said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to him Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And he did not know what, for he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he, changed, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, uh, Why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does, does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that you would be with us today. Send your spirit to work in our hearts and to uh, guide Charles as he opens your word to us, Lord God. Uh, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would continue in prayer where you're sitting, uh, just remain quiet in, in prayer that uh, the Lord would send his spirit to attend to the time uh, for the preaching and for the receiving of the word this morning. So would you please just quietly where you're at, pray that the Lord would send his spirit. Father God, I join with your people in beseeching you, Lord, for the attending of your spirit, Lord, to proclaim your truth, to proclaim Christ, Lord. May it be that we see this as hallowed ground this morning, or the transfiguration. What is taking place here? What are Peter, James, and John really seeing? What are they understanding? And Lord, what do we understand in your word, your more sure word, which you've given to us in comparison to that event? Father, you've given us the more sure word. May we marvel in that this morning, Father. Please make that understandable to us. Please, hey, make my words clear to your people. I desire, Father, to be a servant of Christ and a steward of your mysteries and that being found faithful by the empowering of your spirit. So I ask for that spirit now, Father, and for your people, that our hearts and our minds will be open to hear your word, Lord, to marvel in what has been done at the cross and what is being done right now in our midst, Lord, through your word given to us, the word which you hold all things into existence. May we understand the the greatness of the power that you have displayed to us and the gift of your word given to us and the gift of your son, which became flesh and dwelt among us. So ask, Father, please, for the forgiveness of our sins this morning. Father, you would remove them. You give us a clean conscience this morning to come to your word, to hear your word proclaimed, and Lord, to go from this place boasting only in the cross. So please, bless the time, Father. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we're in this transfiguration. Some have called this hallowed ground, holy ground, a moment of scripture that should be compared in some regards to the resurrection or to his birth. And in some regards, this is one of the, a lot of the theologians' top three, the transfiguration. But we're not given much detail here, is it? How many of you know what Jesus looks like? Can anybody tell me in scripture the details of Jesus? What his hands look like? What, is, what color was his hair? What color were his eyes? What did Jesus look like? 
a hush fell over the crowd. We have nothing, don't we? In one aspect, isn't that kind of nice to not know what he looks like, to have that, that visual picture of him, just to know that he was here, that his presence wasn't something to be marveled at. He wasn't head and shoulders above anyone else, that he was just a common man, right? But we don't know what he looks like. We don't have pictures of him. I mean, you guys see all the flowing hair, and he looks really good in all, this, all, these, all these shows that we see, but we don't know. Nobody's given us a description of him. But here in the text this morning, we see this glory being manifested. We see the humanity being pulled back, and we see the glory, and we can only see the effects of it, right? We can only see the effects of what has transpired in this, but we're on this holy mountain. We're up above all these things. We're at the pinnacle of this, and this is a proof text. Mark has been going through these short little snippets to prove the things that he's been trying to prove, that Jesus is the Son of God, and that in this, Peter has made a confession. If you look back with me, who do people say that I am? In verse 27, Peter is the one who answers. They told him, saying, John the Baptist and others say Elijah, but down in verse 29, and he continued questioning them on the walk up to Caesarea Philippi, but who do you say that I am? This morning, who do you say that Christ is? Who do you say that he is? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. In, full, in the fullness of Matthew 16, we know that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Peter is told, how did you know that? How do you know that, Peter? The father has revealed that to him. Can you answer with Peter this morning? Can you say that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God? Can we marvel in that this morning together and knowing that the Father has revealed that to us? Here's a proof text. Here is a visual picture of the fact that he is God in flesh. Jesus is gonna strip back his humanity and show them the beauty of who he is. So we wanna look at this this morning and the greatness of what it is. The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and when he has been killed, he will rise three days later but they did not understand this statement. This is, in, this is in Mark later on in 31 and 32. This is what the pinnacle of these things are, that they will not understand this statement and they were afraid to ask him. This is the idea that Jesus has told them these things. He's made this clear to them. Remember I said that back in verse 32. He was making this plainly known to them, but they still didn't understand it. How many of you understand that this morning? Oh, praise the Lord that you have the more sure word. Part of what Peter's gonna tell us in this understanding is that he's gonna compare the transfiguration to what you hold in your hands right this morning. Does everybody have their own copy of the word of the Lord this morning? Do you realize that Peter is gonna compare the transfiguration to the more sure word and he's gonna say, what you have is the more sure word as in comparison to the transfiguration. They fall on their faces when they see Jesus. They fall down like dead men. Anybody ever fall down like a dead man? When you read your Bible, do you fall down like a dead man? I mean, think about that for a minute. If this, our scriptures, are the more sure word compared to the transfiguration, shouldn't we fall down dead? But the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands. They didn't understand it. Into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. That's the gospel. But they didn't understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. Wow. Wow. They didn't understand the greatness of this. I want you to look back again also in verse 38. It says, for whoever is ashamed of me. Anyone ashamed of Christ this morning? Anyone ashamed of the gospel? Hmm. So you're out there on the street corner with your sign? Anybody down in the front of the courthouse? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. No, you don't have to, you don't have to do that. <laughs> People are giving me this scrunchy face. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to live a life, though, that's peculiar, right? We're, lived a, we're supposed to live a life that's peculiar. People should be looking at you going... Why do you do the things you do? Why do you mow your lawn that way? Maybe not like that. But the things we do should arise curiosity from those around us. Look at verse 38. He says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous, this sinful generation, this unbelieving generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So there's an emphasis here that there are two comings. They're missing the second coming. They're missing the first coming. They're missing the suffering servant because when he gets into verse one of nine, he says, and Jesus was saying to them, truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. So we have to kind of ask ourselves a question because that verse one is kind of controversial. You know, there's about five different translations of that or not translations, but just applications, understandings of the interpretation of what he means by that kingdom coming and those men dying. Some believe it's the end of time. It's when he comes back. Anybody on that view? 
This, these people are not going to die before they see that. Someone's not going to die before they see the kingdom, and they're going to see a glimpse of the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Some think it's the resurrection. How many of you think it's the resurrection? His resurrection. Or when the Holy Spirit comes in Acts 2. Some believe that. Is it possible? Those are possible things. But what do we see here? It comes at the transfiguration. What is in line with this? Six days later, there's a transfiguration. There's a going up on a mountain. What's a mountain like for a Jew? Anybody think about that? They're going up on a mountain. This is probably Mount Hermon, not Mount Tabor. 9,200 feet. They're going to go up on a mountain, somewhere on this mountain for this transfiguration. This is the same place that Peter has made the confession. What is it like for a Jew? What did they go up on the mountain to see? You go up on the mountain, and that's where Moses was encountering God. You go up on the mountain, and that's where God spoke to his people. That's where Israel understood who they were on tops of mountains, on mountain peaks. They were unresident. So truly I say to you that there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death, who will not die until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power, with power power. Christ is going to reveal himself with power to Peter, James, and John. Why not to everybody? Why not to everybody? Why just Peter, James, and John? John's going to be the first martyr. John's going to live out his entire life and write five books to, for us. Peter, he's going to write two epistles, but he's going to deny Christ, but he's going to finally see the truth of the word of God. We're going to, he's going to marvel in that that there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. In promising the preview of the glimpse of the kingdom, the Greek word here translated is royal splendor. How many of you are ready to see the royal splendor of Christ? What's he look like? Remember, that's why I'm trying to tell you. What's he look like? We're gonna see something that we are going to just blow our minds. Are you okay with that? I wanna see that. I want to see that blowing of my mind. But let's take a look at here. Real quickly, let's just compare the two other accounts. Turn with me to Matthew. Turn with me to Matthew 16. Let's read so we have the full picture of what happened at this transfiguration. Turn with me to Matthew 16, starting up in verse 18. I just want to read this and the Luke account so we understand that there are some things here that Mark doesn't touch on. Mark doesn't touch on a few things that we kind of need to fill in some holes here. A little bit of backstory. So if you look at verse 28 of Matthew 16, we read this. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Verse 1 of chapter 17. Six days later, Jesus took him with him, Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Notice that it says a high mountain. Mount Tabor was just a bump in the road, but Mount Hermon was 9,000 feet. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, taking with him Peter to, said, sorry, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, get up and do not be afraid. And lifting up his eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. Amazing. They fall down and they worship. Turn with me to Luke. Let's look at Luke's account of this in Luke 9. Turn with me to Luke 9. Luke will add in the fact that these guys were asleep from distress. Amazing. that These things transpire and these guys were asleep, just like in the Garden of Gethsemane where they will sleep there too. Look in Luke 9, starting in verse 27. But I say to you, truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Some eight days. Oop. You guys notice that? Wait a minute. How many apologetics are in the, apologists are in the room? Somebody said six, six, twice. Mark and Matthew say six days. And here it says eight days. Some eight days after these things says, now some people will point to this and say there's a contradiction in the accounts. Luke is a Gentile. Luke is basically saying the day that he said this and the day of it are also included. So he says eight days. 
but six days would be the understanding of the Jewish mindset. So there's no controversy here. You have a Gentile giving a, dis- a description, and you have two Jews giving a description. And the six days is important, because six days is what you see in the mountains when Moses is there getting the law. He took along Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, transformed, and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah, who appearing in glory were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. He's going to the cross. That's the subject they're talking about. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep. Wow, seriously. But when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. Is that true? I mean, underline that. There's Peter again, not realizing what he was saying. 34. While he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, underline that, my chosen one, listen to him. The listening there is an obedience. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. They were asleep in this account. In Luke's account, you see different things here. That They were asleep. How could they be sleeping? Because of the greatness of their distress. That Jesus has been telling them that he's going to the cross. And here we see an affirmation of that through Moses and Elijah. Jesus has got to go to the cross. How many of us would have chosen that? None of us would have chosen that. He must go to the cross. Derek Thomas, Dr. Derek Thomas calls this holy ground because of the conversation between Moses and Elijah and what is transpiring here. What is transpiring is a conversation of the necessity of God sending his son to the cross to pay for our sins. What did we celebrate this morning when we took communion? We recognize that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. When you took communion this morning, you proclaimed something. You proclaimed to yourself and to everyone sitting here that Christ has died for you that your sins were put upon his body. His body was put upon a cross. He bled his blood out of his body until he died so that you could be free, so that you could have a righteousness placed on you through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son. That is the topic that Moses and Elijah are talking with Jesus about. And Peter can't handle it, can he? He wants to interrupt. I mean, there's a holy communion going on here between Jesus and Moses and Elijah and Peter has to interrupt and the father has to correct him. I mean, just look at the big picture there. Whoa, holy cow. The pure revelation of God's glory. Paul will talk about Christ in this regard. He will say the Lord of glory of the glory of God and the face. We see this in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. I've taken you to 2 Corinthians 4, 6 many times where Paul writes, of the glory of God and the face of Christ. The writer of Hebrews describes Jesus as the radiance of God's glory. The radiance of God's glory. He's the exact representation of God, of his glory in human flesh. This is what's going on. This is what's being revealed to us. This is what we see as of only begotten from the Father. John will remark about this in John 1.14. He will say, we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, the exact representation of the Father. That's how John will recount this. How about Peter? Peter's gonna compare this, this whole issue here. And some people would say that this is for the disciples, this is for Jesus, and this is for us. You could, do, you could cut this into three sections. You could cut this into three perspectives that this is for those disciples on the mountain, this is for Christ's assurance, and this is for you today. How many of you are interested in all three of those? I'm interested in the last one. How is this for me? How is this for me? Let's take a look at how Peter will refer to this. So John says, we beheld his glory. How does Peter refer to this event as a comparison? Turn with me to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's take a look at what you're holding in your hands every day when you open the word of God. What are we holding in our hands? What is it that we have before us? Turn with me to 2 Peter, starting in verse 16 of chapter one. 2 Peter chapter one, verse 16. This is the eyewitness account. He's gonna say, oh, this glory, this thing that we see. For we 
did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power of the coming of our Lord, Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Verse 17, for when he received honor and glory from God, the Father, such as an utterance of this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So the transfiguration on Mount Hermon, verse 19. So we have the prophetic word made more sure. Underline that verse 19, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. He's referring to what you're holding in your hand right now. He's referring to the word of God delivered to you. The canon of scripture that is in your hands right now is a more sure word. Compared to what? Compared to the glory that we're talking about. Compared to God's glory being manifested on the Mount of Transfiguration, which caused men to fall down as if they were dead. Look at verse 20 in in 2 Peter. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. What are you holding in your hands, ladies and gentlemen? What are you holding in your hands? This is God's product. Well, there's errors. There's lots of errors. There's 100,000 errors in here because there's a lot of thes missing and us and everything else. I'm sorry, I'm being, I'm being Joe the skeptic this morning. I hope you will stone me later. Some people say there's 100,000 errors in here just because the us and thes don't appear in the Greek text. I'm like, are you out of your mind? Are you out of your mind? Yes, some of those people are out of their minds and they have PhDs. It's amazing. You have the more sure word in your hands. You have the revelation of the Christ in your hands. You have what has been testified in this. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus standing on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus pulls his humanity back. What's being displayed there? Have you guys thought about this? Moses, he's the giver of the law. Elijah, he's the protector of the law. Jesus, he's the completion of all of it. Jesus says, all the Old Testament speaks about me. Everything in the law and the prophets is about me. You see in the Mount of Transfiguration this very canon of scripture being displayed. Anybody wanna go to that Mount of Transfiguration? Do you wanna be on the Mount of Transfiguration right now? Would you like to have been there and seen that greatness and that glory? Open up your word. Open this up. Read it. Peter is telling you, he's telling you, you've got something more than what I saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. In your hand, you have more than I had on the Mount of Transfiguration. When I saw his glory and I fell down at his feet, you have it right here in your hands. Young people, old people, all people in this room, think about that. Peter is telling you what you have is better than the Mount of Transfiguration when I saw his glory and saw Moses and Elijah, two witnesses testifying to the fact that he had to die upon the cross. What was the subject matter of Moses and Elijah? What were they talking about? Luke told you. They're talking about the cross, the necessity of the cross. Why is this important for Peter, James, and John? Because they're gonna have to testify about that. They're depressed. They're depressed. They're asleep. Luke said they were sleeping. Have you ever been so depressed that all you wanna do is sleep? Am I the only one in this room that just wants to sleep all the time? Sometimes I was depressed the other day. I was just like looking outside. I'm like, I was just getting depressed. It was depressing. It was cloudy. I got depressed. I'm like, I got to preach tomorrow. I got to tell these people about the glory. I got to tell you guys about the transfiguration. I'm like, whoa. And then I read Peter. I'm like, yeah, Peter. He gets it. Peter gets it. You know, I love, you got to love Peter. He gets it. it. Takes him a while, but he gets it. I'm like that. It takes me a while, but I get it. He's handing us this the more sure word. You want to be on the Mount of Transfiguration? You want to see what Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus about? It's right here. You have it. I want you to take that away with you today because part of the the doctrine of what's being taught here is progressive sanctification. Part of what we see here is progressive sanctification. What we're to understand from this is that we are to go for that glory. We are to see that glory and to pursue that which God is doing within us through the greatness of the gospel. Six days later. Let's turn back. Turn back there. That was my wow moment. I hope you got that wow moment. That was my wow moment. Six days later. Look at verse two, chapter, chapter nine of Mark. Go back in Mark nine, chapter two. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and brought them up on the high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. The word there is metamorphosis. 
metamorphosis. How many of you guys like all the Marvel stuff? You know, something metamorphosis, right? I got a few looks, you know. There's always something like that, isn't there? Some people are like, please don't just talk about that again. I agree, I'm not gonna talk about it. But the, the word here is metamorphosis, metamorphosis. Why is this important, Pastor? Well, there's two of the places this is used, okay? There's two other places that we want to look at this morning. Turn with me to Romans 12. When we talk about progressive sanctification, what is progressive sanctification? We participate in God cleansing us and cleaning us up and getting us ready for heaven. The sanctification, that holiness that we're pursuing. Look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This might be familiar to you, but the same word about this metamorphosis, this transfiguration that you see in this thing, is also for us. This is where we understand the application because the cross reference, the same word is used here in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be, see the word transformed there? That's metamorphosis. How are you to do that? Is this something that God does or do you do this? Keep reading. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Is that something you participate in? The answer is yes. God's gonna see it, make, make sure it comes true. Philippians 1.6 says, that work which he started within you, he'll see to the day of completion, to the day of Christ Jesus. He's gonna make sure it happens, but you get to participate. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? How many of you like pursuing holiness? How many of you did your laundry this week? Cleaned your house? That's not what I'm talking about. That's not the sanctification I'm talking about. But that's the idea of cleansing, right? There is an idea of cleansing in that. So you guys cleaned your house. I hope you guys cleaned your house. I'm gonna come by, check your bathrooms. The idea is cleansing though, cleaning ourselves up, right? We participate in the pursuit of holiness, in the changing of our minds and our life, pursuing Christ. We do that, we participate in that. And here he says, it's in your minds, Everything starts in our minds, ladies and gentlemen. Everything starts in our minds. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We're to be taking consciously, subduing those things in our mind. When they come up, we're to reject certain things and we're to embrace other things. The only way to reject certain things is to embrace Christ. The only power we have is to look at Scripture and say, wow, what was it like for these guys on the Mount of Transfiguration? I need to read about this. Well, Peter says it's the more sure word. I want to read everything I can find in Scripture about the transfiguration and everything that comes out of that, that boils over. His garments became as white as light. This was like lightning. A place over in Tennessee that we're looking at just got hit by a lightning bolt, or a tree got hit by a lightning bolt. And there's this little line that goes all the way down the tree, and the top of the tree is like, out on the golf course. I'm like, whoa. Now, how many of you have seen Lightning. It just, boom, it's gone, right? Boom, it's gone. They're saying that Jesus was like lightning continuously. So now imagine that boom of flash of light that usually guard your eyes or it flashes and you don't look away. They're saying in this that he gleamed like a lightning bolt, that he was still flashing like lightning, but it was continuous. What would you do if you saw that? I'd fall on my face, right? But that's what it was. That was the picture that we see The sign of man will appear in the sky. And this is what we'll see at the end too. All the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the son of man coming on the cloud of the sky with power and great glory in Revelation 19, 11 through 16. This is what we're looking forward to. We're looking forward to a lightning storm that will go over the entire earth. We're waiting for him to return in glory. But we get to see that now in the word of God. We get to see that as we take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. In the progressive sanctification, we get to marvel in that day in and day out. So Elijah came with Moses, two of the best witnesses. You see all of the law and the prophets represented in Moses and Elijah. God spoke to Moses. All the Jewish leaders would say, I want to talk to Moses. We know God talked to Moses. Elijah, he protected the law. What are the two best witnesses to confirm what Jesus is going to go through? Jesus is going to the cross. The disciples don't like that. Who would be the best ones to confirm that? Moses and Elijah. And then Jesus removes his flesh, removes his flesh to show them that he is deity. They needed confirmation, tangible confirmation that this was the plan of God. They wanted to see the Messiah ruling and reigning. 
So for them, it was an affirmation. For them, they see this. For Jesus, he, the, the cloud comes over them and says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Wow, what was that in response to? Uh, one of the guys I listened to said that a man wrote a sermon about this transfiguration. It says, Satan on the Mount. His title of the sermon was Satan on the Mount of Transfiguration. Why would he have written that? The idea was is that there's Peter. Peter's interrupting the discussion about the cross and saying, hey, I want to build you some tabernacles. I want you to stay here. Let's just call it good. This is great. You've been transformed. And this is the time of the Feast of the Booths, Zechariah 14, where they would have celebrated the Exodus. And so Peter is on the right grounds with what's happening right now, right, the emphasis. Let's build you booths, but let's just have it right here and now. Peter just did it again. It's only been eight days, Peter. You just got corrected by Jesus, and now the Father is going to come down and correct you again. This is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Obey him. Peter, so the Son of God corrects you. Father God corrects you. Are you going to keep this up for the rest of your life? The answer is yes. Peter has got a problem. Does he have a problem, or is he just like us? Peter's got a problem. Father comes down. The father comes down and says, listen to him. So Elijah and Moses, they had appeared and they were talking with, with Jesus about the cross. In verse five, look back in Romans, uh, sorry, uh, Mark nine, verse five. But Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Mm. Peter, you want it to just be right now. I want the kingdom right now. I want this to be as far as we go. We don't go any farther. We look at Luke and we know that the conversation was about the cross. One for Elijah, verse six. For he did not know what to answer. Have you ever been in that situation you don't know what to answer but you still say something? You know what the best thing to do? Don't say anything. I mean, Peter's a good example right there, right? Peter didn't know what to say so he says something. It's like, Peter, you're now gonna get corrected by God the Father in the cloud, coming down. You're on a holy mountain. I mean, this is just like Moses receiving the law. I mean, the mountain, Mount Sinai, you know, the cloud forms. You hear the thunder. You hear the voice of God. It's like, Peter, really? Are you serious? You're still gonna go down this road? He's got it in his mind that this is the time. He's got it in his mind that the kingdom of God is now and not he, I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait for a suffering servant. I don't want for Jesus to go to the cross. No, 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 no. I don't want that to happen. It's like, yes, 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 yes. And this is being revealed to them. So this is for them. This is for Jesus. And this is for us today too. But let's just finish this off. Verse seven. Then a cloud formed overshadowing them and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Underline Listen. The idea of the word listen there is to, to hear it, to understand it, and to obey it. Isn't, do you, how many of you guys like Greek? Both of those, all three of those could be in that one word. You could translate it that way. Obey, listen, and understand. So we see listen. You should have a little footnote there. Hopefully you have a, a translation that has a little footnote. It says you need to understand it and you need to obey it. Verse eight, all at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. In the other accounts, we see that he raised them up. He lifts them up out of that. And he called him rabbi. In the other accounts, he calls him Lord and master. One of the ideas there is that he continued to say these things. He continued to say, we need to do this. We need to build you a tabernacle. This is as far as it goes. You go no further. Let it be, this is the end of all of this. So Peter Peter didn't understand the suffering servant. Peter just did not understand at this point in time what was going on, but he's given this assurance. We're given the beauty of this, and we understand from Peter's account that he understood this later on and that the word given would be the more sure word so that we would see the beauty of the sanctification that is involved in all of this. So what about the day-to-day? So Christian, as I talked to you this morning, believer and unbeliever, But first, the believer. Let us understand that we are gonna go through many trials and tribulations before we enter the kingdom of God. Are we in the midst of the kingdom of God yet? No. But the kingdom of God is within you. Remember what Jesus told Luke. The kingdom of God is within us. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Acts 14, 22. 
We suffer with him so that we may also what? Be glorified with him. That's Romans 8, 17. Why do we suffer in this life? Just like Jesus suffered, that we might be glorified with him. Because all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yet we understand that, quote, the degree that we share the sufferings of Christ, we keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, we may rejoice with exaltation. This isn't it. Knowing that our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord, Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of your humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Philippians 3. Let's end with that. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. What are we looking forward to? I'm reading a book now by Oz Guinness. He says, what is the purpose of life? Why? What are you called to? Are we called to something that we would give up everything that we have and pursue? Is there something worth living for? And is there something worth dying for? If I were to ask you that question right now, is there something worth living for and something worth dying for? Do you know your calling in this life? Do you have something to live for and die for? And it's worth everything. Let me read to you from this section here, starting up in verse 12. No, what is it? Sorry. No, 17. He's making a comparison here. He's making a comparison to the things around us, just like the psalmist did in Psalm 73. In Psalm 73, the comparison there is between those prospering who don't know the Lord. Are we jealous of that? Are we jealous to see that those who are in the world who don't know the Lord are prospering, and yet we are suffering? I don't see us suffering. He's making a comparison here in the 17th verse of chapter 3 of Philippians, but we want to finish with what's in 20 and 21, which I just read to you. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. Verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform, there it is again, who will metamorphose you, who will transform you, who will change you in form, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. How many of us want to be conformed to the image of Christ? Anybody? You want to be metamorphosed? Amen. I want to be metamorphosed, not like the Marvel comics. Sorry for the guys who... I want his spirit to completely cleanse me of the body that I have right now. I want to be like Jesus, right? I want to have this this body ripped away and my spirit free and to be glorified, to be made and conformed to the image of Christ, to be like him. When we'll see him, we'll be like him. You won't be Jesus, but you'll be like him. You'll be like the Mount of Transfiguration. But for now, the application for now is the sanctification, the transforming of your minds. So how do you do that? It's right in front of us. What did Peter compare the transfiguration with? The more sure word. Do you want to experience the transfiguration? Do you want to experience that glory? It's right here. That's what Peter's saying. You got it. Hey, everybody, you got it. It's in your hands. When you open this up, you get to see Christ transformed, metamorphosed, the glory of God before you. I don't know. I haven't read it that way. I'm going to start reading it that way. I think I need to start reading this and going, wow, this is like being on the Mount of Transfiguration and hearing the Lord, hearing the Father say, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Obey him. Listen to him. Wow. That's what, Peter, that's what Peter's telling us. This is the more sure word. Let's pray. Father, may we be like Peter. Lord, he finally got it. He finally understood the greatness and the glory. He finally understood who Christ was. He finally understood the necessity of the cross. 
that there first must be trials and tribulations. There must first be suffering in this life. And these are momentary light afflictions compared with the glory yet to come. Father, may we understand what Paul understood, what he reveals to us, what he gives to us, that your word breathed out is given to us, Lord, to help our understanding that we have in our hands the more sure word. Everything in life and godliness is given to us. May we be like Peter. May we understand. May we get that today that you've given us, Lord, your precious gift, the word which became flesh and dwelt among us, the word which we read every day. I hope we do, Father. I hope we do read it every day. I hope that I will be faithful to that. I hope that your people will be faithful to that, marveling in what you've given to us and the greatness of your word. So, Father, please, bless us with that understanding today. Bless us with the understanding you gave to those three disciples, to Peter, James, and John. What a blessing that account is. What a blessing it is to see it this morning. Please, go before us, Father, in the life that we live here, that our boast is in the cross of Christ. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.